Hey, welcome back to Low Budget Logistics, your logistics and supply chain explainer. And today we're going to have a fantastic uh, discussion about uh, the relationship that, that really turns the world um, around. And it's uh, it's important, so please stay tuned. It's, it's also going to be slightly contentious because uh, China, as uh, as everyone knows, is sort of a bit of a hot spot, um, and it's uh, it's kind of a, a rife with uh, with discussion. So, uh, all that being said, before uh, it get demonetized, or well, I'm not even monetized, doesn't really matter. Uh, but please like and subscribe to the video. Um, for more content like this. Um, so uh, obviously we're going to be talking about uh, some geopolitical relations uh, today, which is less uh, really supply chain focused, but really important because where we get stuff matters and how it, it came to be is also important. And really uh, the relationship between China and the U.S. is really interesting uh, because a lot of like things all happened around the same time uh, that really gave rise to uh, to what we know today. Now, you've no doubt heard me talk about the specifics, uh, the importance of world geography um, on supply chain, specifically because um, you know you can't change the distance between one place and another, and that that is important um, to to take into note and to and to be at least cognizant of, um, and because those are like hard restrictions on things. Um, one of the other things that's extremely important is geopolitics in the world of the supply chain. So China and the U.S. is an excellent example of that. Currently, uh, there's some tension between China and the U.S. We're, we are each other's biggest trading partners, um, and, and a lot of the U.S. economy is really driven by Chinese manufacturing um, and the easy access to Chinese ports and Chinese labor um, to make the stuff um, at a relatively inexpensive price so that we can get it into the U.S. Um, and, and you know, sell a lot of volume. So if you've watched the, the price and sales um, video that just probably recently posted, um, watch that. It'll be important to understand, you know, how important getting that like low, low cost, high price um, stuff into the U.S. is for that maximum volume for a business. All right, so the relationship between the U.S. and China in its current state, it really started in the, in the early 80s. Uh, I think around 1979 is when the U.S. really normalized um, political relationships or, and relations with China. Um, and that, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but mainly at that point in time, the Chinese government started becoming um, a lot more uh, soft on and really cozy to um, capitalism as the rest of the world saw it. Before that, China as a as a population really was highly industrial, or sorry, highly agricultural. They didn't have a whole lot of industrial, um, you know, manufacturing capabilities. Um, but what they did have was a large population that was, to some extent, really underutilized, um, and sort of looking for jobs and and willing, willing to take <laughs> take a lower um, uh, salary or lower you know payment uh, for making something. There's a lot of reasons for that um, that we could sort of go into in a, in a separate video as far as um, you know the relative strength of the Chinese yuan in relation to the U.S. dollar and how it competes on the global stage, and getting into sort of global economics, global financing, uh, but just sort of understand that like it was a lot e like the amount that was needed to uh, for for Chinese workers to earn. Um, sort of relatively speaking, was lower than uh, what U.S. workers needed to earn. Again, a lot of reasons for that. We won't get into that in this video, but just sort of understand that. On the other side of the Pacific, the U.S. was sort of coming out of a huge inflationary period in the 70s um, where gas prices spiked, prices of, of automobiles and homes and everything just sort of went crazy through the roof. Um, and the U.S. Fed had to start um, really clamping on interest rates at, to, to lower um, the amount of inflation that we were seeing in the U.S. Around the early 80s, um, we started to see um, that sort of taking into effect um, and U.S. workers were sort of coming out of this slump. Um, and we basically what that meant is that we we as a population had more money to spend on stuff. Um, and so we had all this money, we had all this capital, we're looking to spend it, um, but we just didn't have the labor force that, that could really make the stuff at the price that we wanted to pay. So we're just sort of sitting around on a lot of dollars. Um, also in the US, super important, 
um, is that transportation was becoming a lot less complicated. That is an important point. Um, so prior to uh, this period of time, the FAA kept really strong, um, you know, they kept a really strong clamp on like US air traffic. Um, and there was a lot of regulations as far as how um, air transport could happen, would happen, who could do it. There was a lot of like legal requirements. And when that happens, when you have an industry that is extremely regulated, it drives out competition. Um, and so right before this, uh, like in the, in the late 70s, FedEx really came into being with the idea of uh, you know overnight shipping and transportation. It was relatively small at that point in time. Um, and then when uh, under the Reagan administration, the FAA sort of deregulated a lot of, uh, of their you know, control, um, FedEx was allowed to, to bloom. And that really gave birth to this idea of overnight shipping and using the air as a sort of you know, more acceptable and more profitable uh, mode of transportation. On top of that, just prior, so in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, container ships uh, became a thing. <laughs> so before that, because this is like a, a huge point in like supply chain history, before that everything was being done like on a, like with cranes uh, and not like the cranes that you see at a port now, but like actual like cargo nets that would just sort of, you, someone would have to like throw cargo into this net and then a crane would pick it up and then move it to the side, like off onto the port and then someone else would have to like offload it. That's what longshoremen used to do. They don't do that now. They still exist as a thing, but they don't, they're not, a, they don't do that thing anymore. So with the advent of container ships and saying like, oh, there's an easier way of doing this. We can, we can make a box and have it be universally sized and we can create machinery that is designed specifically to move this thing as fast as possible and we'll make it so that we can go right off of the ship onto a truck that truck can actually leave the port if necessary um, that speeds up the entire process so much um, that that like it has astounding ripple effects into the broader economy on top of all of that these ships started getting massive uh, because you needed a lot less, you know, space. You could design ships in, in ways that you could carry hundreds of thousands of tons um, on a ship. It became extremely profitable um, at that scale to just move a bunch of stuff. And so we started seeing um, prices for airline shipments, um, like the overnight, really fast stuff, becoming way cheaper. Um, and then also shipping on the ocean become became much faster and much cheaper. So when that happens... Right, you've got a lot of this dry tinder that's just waiting to spark. Um, and really the spark at that point in time was, we need someone to make stuff. And that's where China really had an edge. So the US normalizes regulations, uh, normalizes relationships with China. Um, and then US manufacturers start seeing, okay, we've got a lot of people, people are hungry to buy stuff. They're, they're coming out of the 70s where things are bad. Um, let's figure out like we we want to we want to meet this expected demand but we can't make it in the u.s and so they look and they some really smart supply chain person goes oh we could just make this stuff over there because there's all of these advances in transportation we can now move things easily and cheaply let's do it so the u.s uh manufacturing base essentially shifts over to China. And there's a lot of discussions about that. That is its own separate topic. It is it is extremely politically fraught, um, but just sort of understand like offshoring of US jobs, that's what that means is that the US worker effectively became too expensive. And I know that is a that is such a broad generalization, um, but it, for the matter, <laughs> matters of this discussion, we're gonna leave it at that. They became too expensive and so we, we in the supply chain, large businesses, found ways to shift that that expense to lower it significantly and to shift it somewhere else. That became uh, China. Now, so when that started happening, the Chinese government, again, being a lot softer on capitalism, decided, oh, we should start really um, investing in this thing and we will start in like export manufacturing. And we're gonna do a lot of things 
that will help assist that. So if you're thinking about like ways that a country and a government could really assist in, you know, making things attractive for, uh, for foreign companies, we think about things like how big are the ports? How much throughput can the ports sustain? What does the infrastructure around those ports look like as far as roads and railroads and trains and bridges and truckers and all of that stuff? And at, and so China just started investing in that. Now China, it currently, as of 2023, they have like the, the vast majority of their ports are the biggest ports in the world, uh, at least by tonnage moved or containers moved. There's a lot of different metrics as far as how ports are measured, but but just sort of like by space, by uh, the amount of like cargo that can get moved, China has like some of the top ports in the world, like the port of Hong Kong, the port of Yanqian, the port of Beijing, Shanghai. Those are all massive ports that can move a ton of stuff out of those, uh, out of those areas and those manufacturing uh, facilities. The other thing that the Chinese government did is really smart. They started parceling off broad swaths, like physical areas of their, um, of their geography, of their regions, and saying, hey, if you make stuff in this physical area here, we won't charge you any uh, exporting taxes, any tariffs. We, won't, we, won't, we will not do that. This area will be designated as a free trade zone, which deserves its own video. Um, but basically saying like, hey, anything here is effectively international air property uh, and you, you don't get any, we're not going to charge you any um, additional taxes to like make stuff here. That is such a strong incentive um, for, <laughs> for uh, manufacturing and production uh, because that's like 10% of the price of your item is going to go to um, some sort of tax. So if you drop that, that's a strong signal to, hey, make stuff there. Um, there are places in the world that, that the British set up really early in like the 1600s, 1700s um, as free ports, specifically uh, Hong Kong when it was a British protectorate and Singapore, again, when it was a British protectorate. Um, those are both set up as free ports and stuff coming into and out of there didn't have to get um, you know imported, didn't have to do taxes. Um, and those areas right even now are extremely strong economic centers in the region. Um, so you can imagine if you just basically replicated that idea in the Chinese mainland, my goodness, <laughs> you're going to see some, you know, extreme, um, you know, investments in your country. And that's exactly what happened. So U.S. manufacturers were seeing all this demand uh, or expected demand. They, they see all this dry tinder in the area and they just need a spark and they sort of just ignite it with Chinese, like cheap Chinese labor. And my goodness, uh, it has effectively become the, the model for third world countries that want to advance and want to become prosperous. They basically follow that same model where they'll say, hey, we have a large population that is relatively um, underutilized. We want to start moving up in the world. We want foreign investment. Let's do these same things. So they'll parcel off land that's free trade areas, um, and then they will they'll work um, to uh, facilitate some political agreements with uh, importing countries, so like the U.S. Um, and and that sort of <sighs> makes them more prosperous. That gives um, you know their their people a better quality of life. And it's 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 it, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that you could sort of talk about as far as. Uh, you know, downsides, we will talk about those later, but, but just know like for the, for the majority of people in the world, it's helped them significantly where before you might've been like a subsistence farmer. Um, and if you have a bad year and a bad crop, bad harvest, then good luck, right? Because there's not a, there's not a security net around you. Um, the creation of foreign investment has really allowed these people to prosper they're able to shift their their work away from just subsistence farming towards a better paid job again relative relatively better paid job um and and so they're able to move up the economic ladder and provide a bit more of a safety net for themselves and and provide for their families and a lot of really really great things and so the model that china has provided for the world is 
is important to understand and to know. Um, it, it, there's a lot of other things that we could talk about as far as the U.S. and China, especially as they involve like microchips and high tech things. Um, but but just know the relationship as it used to exist um, in sort of the better times when when things weren't as tenuous was really amazing. And it, it really is a sort of gem in global history. Um, and it has allowed for uh, the prosperity of um, of millions around the world. And it it is the way that um, that that nations that are, you know, uh, underinvested and are able to access foreign markets and are able to access foreign capital and to start seeing improvements um, in, in the lives of everyday people. Yeah, so that's that's that. That's all the really good stuff. <laughs> that's all the, uh, that's the fun, you know, really hopeful side of the relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, a lot of the global economy is based around that. Um, other countries are also large trading partners with China. In the area, right, we can think of places like Russia, so again, another tenuous, difficult subject, but uh, Australia and Britain and Europe as a whole, like continent, the EU, um, all of those um, those countries are major trading partners with China. And so Chinese labor really drives the global economy in a, in a large way. Um, <clears throat> the other like other side of it is that um, when when you know that the world is based off of cheap labor and that countries are um, are driving towards you know prosperity it, it effectively becomes a race to the bottom to say like hey who who can we find that will produce stuff at the cheapest price that's pride of place um, you know you have, if you're if you're a business and you're being courted by a lot of different countries, you're going to choose the country that either has the best infrastructure um, or the cheapest labor or whatever, right? Because you want to lower the cost as much as possible to maximize your profit. Again, we'll get into that. But that is one of the downsides is that for for a Western company and for Western um, economics, there is a strong drive to the bottom for uh, for labor prices. And so know that we'll discuss that uh, in a bit in another video, but I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope that it was interesting. Um, it was a very hopeful video. It's very happy <laughs> tone. Uh, but uh, again, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching it all the way through, um, sticking with me. I know that it was a, kind of a difficult political one, um, but it, it was important. So all that being said, thank you so much for watching and I hope you, oh, please leave a like and subscribe down below. Leave me a comment. I read them all. They're, they've been fascinating. Um, please share with a friend. Uh, we've seen some really strong growth with the channel, uh, which is just exciting. Um, so I hope that uh, we continue to grow. All that stuff helps. Um, and uh, I hope you have a fantastic day.